He's he's done you down twice in the last two years. You can't you can't join him after that. Like it's uh, not allowed. No, nope. Tell you what, if I got a bag, I'd throw the U up right now. No, I'm oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> Do they even have bags to give anymore? I know they're a little dried up. Right well, now. yeah. Oh good. damn! All right, damn. Okay. Stock prices are going down rapidly as we speak. <laughs> Hey guys, it's Terrence Nan. You're listening to Hear the Spear presented by No Game Day. Go Dose. Hey, what's up? This is Peter Ward, aka E Dub, in the house. So we're listening to Hear the Spear presented by No Game Day. Go live, go Nose. Hi, this is Charlie Ward, and you're listening to Hear the Spear, go Nose. This is Terrell Fuckley. You're listening to Hear the Spear presented by No Game Day. No Bloody. But perhaps better known as the greatest corner to ever step on a football field, Deion Primetime Sanders. The great Deion Sanders, my brother. What's going on, man? I, I could wake up to that greedy every day, man. That was awesome. Hello, those fans. This is former Seminole Derek Brooks, and you're listening to Hear the Spear, presented to you by No Game Day. James Wilder Jr. What's going on, James? Thanks for having me on. SSOD, Florida State or Die, and go no. William Barnon Floyd. Gentlemen, what's up? What's happening, guys? This is Logan Robinson from here. The Spear presented to you by NoGamedia.com. We are here live on a wonderful Wednesday evening, a little bit earlier than usual here at 7 o'clock. We've got a lot to talk about this week after a really busy week last week, but we've got a lot of things to go over to touch on with me this evening. We've got Austin VZ at the top right, our lead basketball writer at NoGamedia.com. And down below is our editor-in-chief, Dustin Lewis. Gentlemen, good to see you guys. It has been a fun last couple of weeks. Some transfers. We had the NFL draft. We also have some transfers coming to visit. It's, we're just all over the place right now in this 2023 offseason. Yeah, it's definitely felt like uh, more than seven days since the last time we were on here. A lot has occurred, and obviously the transfer portal spring window now for football is closed um, outside of graduate transfers. So, yeah, just a lot has transpired over the last week, especially with the NFL draft kind of coinciding with it all. And not even just football. We've, we've gotten some basketball transfer news. It's, it's been a wild seven days. Yeah, it's been a ton of stuff. And the last podcast we had was about Joshua Farmer, which we'll start off the episode this week talking about. But it's it's just like kind of surprises left and right. And, you know, we're just going to see if this offseason is going to continue being that way. But before we get started with our podcast this week, uh, make sure you guys are following us. Uh, on Twitter, Facebook, make sure that you're subscribed to us on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify. If you're on YouTube right now, feel free to hit the comments if you have any questions or topics you guys would like us to discuss. But let's go and jump into some things, guys. Let's talk Joshua Farmer going backwards. He puts his name into the transfer portal and then takes it out the next day. He puts out a note saying that after some challenging discussions and figuring out some things on his end, along with Florida State, he is going to return for another season with Florida State. We talked about it. Joshua Farmer, a talented defensive tackle that continues to improve year by year. Dustin, we saw him during spring camp. Looks good. You know, he's a guy that disrupts against Florida State's offensive line day after day. So he was going to be a big time contributor and in, in, in this upcoming season for FSU. So that's why we had a huge discussion last week. You know, you don't want to see a guy like that leave. And so it seems like things got all figured out. And now farmers back for the big season ahead in 2023. Pretty big news for Florida State. Obviously, the chatter was there that Joshua Farmer could leave Florida State alongside Darrell Jackson, who had just transferred into FSU back in January. And it was actually kind of funny. Shortly after we got out for the podcast, Jackson kind of reaffirmed his standing with Florida State on social media. And then, you know, by the time Thursday afternoon rolled around, Joshua Farmer, like you said, backed out of the transfer portal, said that he was going to be returning to Florida State. So, I mean, this is absolutely massive um, for the Seminoles to have two of their, you know, top top four, top five defensive linemen back on this roster through at least the 2023 season. And especially for Joshua Farmer, guys continue to develop, continue to show promise. This is big for Florida State in 2024 when you're going to have a lot of guys leaving FSU on defense, I mean, and on offense 
following this upcoming season, season, having a guy like Joshua Farmer back in the fold for 2024, a guy who could be a potential star still at this college level as things come together for him, is massive for FSU, like I said, with the talent that you're expected to lose after this year. It's big for the 24 season more than this season, like we talked about last week. Uh, once once Terrell Jackson put put out his tweet, I'm like, oh, maybe Farmer's coming back after all. And then, like you said, next day, he, he backed out of the transfer portal. It felt like he was only actually in the portal for about eight hours but before he took himself out, which I, I think we all think it's a big thing for Florida State going forward. His development's been big for this defensive line and the room as a whole. It's going to be interesting to see how he figures into the rotation this season and then going forward in 24 where he might be a projected starter. Yeah, yeah definitely didn't it take him didn't take him very long to back out of that portal once he officially entered his name into it. And we kind of talked about it last week. You know, it was always a possibility and this was something Florida State wanted. You know, they were in constant communication with Joshua Farmer to kind of try and resolve the scenario and I think it's for the best of both parties that they were able to get this done. Like Austin said, Joshua Farmer came into FSU as a local recruit, um, a guy who has really developed over his his first couple of years at Florida State with his play and with his body. So I think just showing um, the development from both sides, you know, it's going to be good for Florida State moving forward. Thank you. You brought it up last week, Dustin, along with uh, Joshua Farmer and going into next year, he's going to have a chance to start for Florida state. And I don't think that it was going to have to take too much from Florida state's side to show him how much he could contribute this year and the two deep and whatever happens. Cause Florida state last year, you saw Fabian Lovett go down and Joshua Farmer was a piece that was plugged in to play quite a bit behind him. And that is exactly what's going to happen this year in case something happens to uh, those guys in the front ahead of him. And Florida state did what they needed to do in the transfer pool. And I think there was a lot of miscommunication and you've got, Daryl Jackson coming in and I'm sure he was offered a few things and maybe farmer felt like he was of that level that he deserved the same or more, or, you know, it just, when NIL gets introduced to this, definitely on the college side with college players and you don't have a lot of, that's the thing right now. There isn't like really a lot of set representation for some of these players because they can individually handle some of this business stuff on their own. So the, the, the whole NIL thing, we, we've got a long, long ways to go. And, you know, there's a few out there that, you know, people are representing these players, but this is where it gets into, it's like NFL-esque to me, where you are just got to start figuring out a number and you want higher and you usually want higher and higher. And it's just how it's going to be for a good long while as we're continuing to cover college football with the NIL. And, you know, Florida State wanted to keep, wants to have Josh Farmer on this team. He is a solid player for Florida State. He's got a bright future, and he's a player. You want to keep a player that continues to improve, and he does that year by year by year, and he's able to stay healthy too. So have him for 2023 huge, and then 2024 even bigger and what they want to do on the defensive line. Uh, and then and the same goes for Daryl Jackson. He was still waiting on the waiver there. But, you know, once yep. hopefully Florida State gets some good news there, it's just even bigger for this upcoming year where Florida State is trying to make a run here. So, um, you know, those two guys being tight, close and knit, and, you know, Corey Fuller too. Our former co-host here on, on Here the Spear, close connection between both of those guys. Very, very close. So, you know, I, I had a feeling good things would come eventually just – Got a, you know communication, a little bit of time, and some conversations, and th and then things ended up working. So, some some good news at least of keeping a guy from leaving the leaving the program and getting out of the transfer portal. But on the other side, it's a, it's a handful of others that Florida State is losing off of its roster, which we can discuss right now. If you guys uh, want to jump into that, I think number one, let's start off with Micah Pittman deciding to enter the transfer portal. And I think this one was a surprise to many and, you know, just understanding to the health that he's having to go through recovery wise and et cetera, et cetera, his relationships within the program. I think, you know, Mike Norvell and him very close. We saw that in practice, you know, two guys that pushed one another, but you could just tell there's some some true love between Mike Norvell and Micah Pittman, and then certainly between his teammates too with Jordan Travis and a few others like Marie Smith. You see it on the vlogs and everything. This is a guy that really loved Florida State, 
love Tallahassee, but is deciding to, to do what is best for him. And he's got a long recovery ahead. And I, I think Florida State came to a situation where what is my availability and my depth going to look like going into a season where this has got to be a run? You know, you, you're dumping in a lot of NIL. You're dumping in a lot of players deciding to come back. You got Jared Verse, you got Trey Benson, you got Jordan Travis, you've got Johnny Wills. I mean, and then on defensively, it just goes on and on. If you're going to make a move and you have to do it, it has to be now. And it's where you kind of start evaluating who, what am I going to have? Am I going to have Micah Pittman? Am I going to have him by at least the middle of the season? When am I going to have him? And I think there's discussions that were had that evaluated to where whatever is best for both Micah Pittman and also Florida State was handled. And that's kind of the conclusion that it came to because you could tell that it didn't, there wasn't any kind of bad juju after him announcing the, the, the intention of entering the transfer portal, which is, uh, which is a good thing. You see Mike Norvell giving gratitude towards his, his, his former wide receiver. Yeah, it seemed like maybe, if anything, this was a possible mutual decision for both parties to kind of look elsewhere because, I mean, there is a little bit of uncertainty regarding Pittman's status for the 2023 season. Obviously, he had that surgery for the um, labrum tear in his hip a couple of, um, well, not months ago, back towards the start of March, and his expected timeline that he announced in his video at the time was around four to six months. But it's important to remember, it was a they found out it was a full labrum tear um in that hip and i mean it's a long recovery process to go back through especially for a guy who's a a d1 athlete and wide receiver out there making cuts and everything like that i mean it's a tough injury to come back from but regardless i think this is going to be a pretty underrated loss for florida state Pittman, part a part-time starter for fsu at wide receiver last year you know he wasn't elite with his production or anything like that but it kind of just felt like you knew what you got out of micah Pittman every Saturday that he was coming out on the on the field. He was going to contribute a couple of catches whenever the ball came his way, you know, be a solid playmaker. And even better than that, I mean, he was a very underrated blocker for Florida State out there on the outside, and that's a huge part of this offense for the wide receivers. And even more than that, Florida State's primary punt returner averaged almost 10 yards per return, which was a top 15 in the country. And I don't think he dropped a punt all season. And that was an issue that had kind of plagued Florida State a little bit over – the first two years that Mike Norvell was here in Tallahassee. Um, You know, you think back to that game against LSU last year. I know Florida State didn't convert technically with points on either of those fumbles that they were able to recover on muff muff punts. But, I mean, you're going to be going into a game against LSU now with a new starting punt returner in a crucial, tough environment. So, I mean, I think it could end up being a pretty big loss for FSU. He, he competed more than anything. He just, he brought the nastiness on the edge that you kind of like, you, you you mentioned it with his blocking. He was one of the best block receivers Florida State had. And you know, Norvell places an emphasis in that with how they use their running backs and how they use those receivers. You got to be able to block on the outside if you want to play. It, but like you said, his punt returning, that that's going to be the biggest loss for Florida State. How they replace that is really to be determined as someone that's had the same injury as him, you know, there's really no telling if he's even going to come back 100%. I'm six years from my first labrum tear, and I'm still not even 100%. I'm not saying he can't, but I've, I've been through it. It's a really tough injury to come back from and to try to have the same explosiveness. It's a really, really tough injury. It's not like a shoulder that you see happen a lot. You see a lot of labrum tears in the shoulder. You really don't see it in the hip a lot. Um, it's going to be interesting. You know, I think he got a crystal ball to Utah, correct me if I'm wrong. Yep. If he goes there, you know, he may not play until November. There's a very real chance that that happens, and Florida State can't can afford that in a season they're trying to win a national championship. And Florida State already went through spring uh, spring practice without Micah Pittman. It was announced that he'd missed uh, the spring before things got underway for Florida State. So, I mean, they've been experimenting at that punt returner spot, obviously in the slot with guys like Ja'Kai Douglas and Winston Wright still trying to make that comeback. But, I mean, especially at Palmer Turner, in my opinion, you know, being out there watching practices, there, there's just been too many balls on the ground at this point. You know, whether it's um, Vandravius Jacobs has been back there a little bit, Winston Wright, uh, I mentioned Ja'Kai Douglas. You know, they've, they've all been back there. Um, Wright and Douglas are the two working at the slot. I think Vandravius could eventually contribute at the slot wide receiver. He spent most of his time on the outside so far. But, I mean, with Pittman moving on, I think that's something – 
worth exploring. And and also, you know, we noted it earlier this week, but Joshua Burrell has moved back to a quote unquote wide receiver number. He's back at number 81, still listed on Florida State's roster as an athlete, but he came into Florida State um, as a wide receiver. And, you know, maybe with Pittman moving on, that, that could be another guy you kind of experiment there with there in the slot. Um, Jaheim Bell, too, you know, he's going to probably get flexed in the slot a little bit from that tight end spot like we've talked about. So, I mean, Florida State, they've got some stuff to work with, but replacing a guy who was pretty solid in Micah Pittman and also someone who, Logan, you said it, but was someone who was beloved by Mike Norvell and the rest of the guys on the roster really contributed to the culture here. Um, a, a tough loss for Florida State. And definitely, it definitely stinks. And I'm, I'm wishing them best. Definitely, Utah is a, a great program. And if he's able to get fully healthy and get back into a groove, that would be huge for him. But like we were discussing earlier, I think this was a mutual decision and best for both parties. And, uh, you know, Florida State's looking to go on a run here. And you got to build some depth. You got to have some guys that are available. And last year, you had a guy come in like Winston Wright that you didn't get to see play last year. And I think you're still contemplating if you'll have Winston Wright fully ready to go for 2023. So a lot of question marks in that wide receiver room. I think that was some good points that both of y'all brought up that Florida State's going to have to handle this offseason. We'll have a discussion here in a little bit about what they're trying to do in the transfer portal with a with a target or two. But uh, yeah, Micah Pittman, I, I thought it was super impressive to see him in some games and how physical he was as a wide receiver. I haven't seen that in a while from, from a wide receiver from Florida State. And to see him go out and block for some of his teammates like that, it grew a lot of respect from his teammates in that locker room. So it's definitely a miss that I think uh, that, that, that locker room uh, got hit with, you know, not, not so happy. So uh, wishing, him, wishing him the best for sure. And it's crazy. It, it, it just – I just want to bring up some, and I know not everybody listening is like this. Some are just here to just look and listen for news and stuff. But some of the things that, you know, FSU fans and maybe it's mainly FSU Twitter just instantly just going after a player because they're making a decision that's best for them and just trashing them on social media. You know, got to make fun of the YouTube now. After you've been watching it for months and over a year, you're going to go now and make fun of it. It's pretty classless pretty classless and embarrassing so this fan base there's a there's a quite a few of them out there but i just thought i'd have to mention that because it kind of it's a little it's just it's uh it's immature and you know it's a, there's a few out there that like to do that it's just doesn't make sense to me sometimes definitely when they put out the uh blood sweat and tears out on the football field and then instantly gonna turn on them turn on them like that that quickly just sad sad to see sometimes anyways mm. um Let's move on to a few other players here. Let's talk about Amarion Cooper. This is one that was also like, hello, okay, this safety room is thin. But, yeah, Florida State defensive back Amarion Cooper has decided to enter the transfer portal. He moved from cornerback Delu and VZ this spring over to the safety position. Mike Norvell said that he really was enjoying the transition and thought he was starting to get a hang of it quite a bit. And we saw that throughout camp, but – He's doing now a decision to leave, and maybe he didn't like the idea of having that position change. That's the only thing that I'm thinking of here. But now Florida State is super thin at safety. But what are y'all's thoughts about Cooper entering the NCAA transfer portal? Another tough loss for Florida State. You know, obviously thinking back to that 2021 season, he was a guy along with Kevin Knowles at the time who really started to come along strong as true freshmen, especially – the back end of that 2021 season, both of them coming uh, down with big plays at crucial times. I think it was a Cooper who was able to get an interception in that win that Florida state was able to pull off against Miami um, at home two years ago. And then you kind of go into to last year, 2022, a little bit of a sophomore slump there struggled at times. Um, and then now made that move to safety in the spring. And, you know, I, I didn't really have any, quote unquote complaints with his play, but there wasn't a lot that he did to stand out as well. But now with that loss, like you said, Logan, Florida State growing extremely thin there in the back end. And the Marion Cooper, I mean, you know, I don't want to say that he was potentially poached here by another program because I'm not going to get on the podcast and speculate on something like that. But he sure did land pretty damn quick at Colorado alongside uh Derek McClendon and Brendan Gant just two or three days or so after he entered the portal, already had made that commitment to Dion. So really interesting how Colorado already stacking up now on three Florida State transfers. 
Hmm. Yeah, I, I felt like he wasn't fully healthy last season. He was laboring at times in coverage, but he's still super talented. And we came in, you know, just a couple weeks ago thinking, you know, Florida State needs to add at least one safety in the transfer portal. And then they lose two this past weekend. We'll, we'll talk about Travis J here in a second, but they, they've got to add a safety. And I know they've got one visiting this weekend, but they, they may even have to add two safeties just for some depth. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it's it's as thin as I, it's easily the thinnest position group on in the team. I think we were talking about it last week. There's a lot of inexperience back there behind uh, Akeem Dent and then Shaheen Brown, which still Shaheen Brown. I don't think of someone being filled with a whole ton of experience. Yeah, he's been out there a, a good little bit, but you know, not at the Akeem Dent uh, tier of experience. Mm, right. it, it, it's way That's too it. thin. And I, you're one injury away from playing a guy that's never played before. Like it's one of those. And you're well, they're going to play regardless, man. They're going to have to rotate in unless Florida State does land one of these transfers. And there's also a JUCO guy that we're going to bring up later in the show. But yeah, I mean, right now you're looking at it four scholarship safeties. Um, maybe FSU explores something at cornerback. You know, Renardo Green has played safety in his career before. You've got a guy like Jerry and Jones who I believe has the versatility to play either safety or cornerbacks. I mean, we'll see if Florida State does some experimenting here. But like you said, Austin, um, you're definitely going to have to dive into the transfer portal of Florida State, like I mentioned, also exploring some JUCO prospects that could qualify for the 2023 class and get here in the summer or or uh, towards the beginning of the fall. But, I mean, right now just looking at the projected scholarships um, based off Florida State losing nine players in the spring, eight during that 15-day portal window i've got fsu projected around 80 out of 85 allocated scholarships so i mean you're definitely looking at a couple of spots here i do want to note we don't exactly know the status of guys like uh kaiseya holmes cj campbell preston daniel and um dante anderson we're not exactly sure if they're still walk-ons if they're on scholarship at this point that's not something that florida state gives a lot of uh priviness to so i mean a little bit of give and take there, but right now projecting them at 80 out of 85, and that's not including Destin Hill. You know, if he actually does show up at some point, we'll add him to those numbers, but right now not counting them. Well, and then the funny thing is the discussion doesn't stop at safety. Travis J enters the transfer portal as well. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we've already been talking about it for a minute, but you got to make a move in the transfer portal, but it just stinks for Travis J, a guy that didn't get to see last year on the field and he comes in in the spring and, you know, didn't get to see him in the spring showcase and, and participate in that. But a guy that was really buying in the spring camp early on and things just, just not going in, in his favor. And it's a, if you go all the way back to his high school days from Madison County, being one of Florida state's one highest profile guys coming in his class, yeah. it, it just stinks. A, a talent, a, you know, you know, is there, it just wasn't fitting here in Tallahassee. And it just goes to add on to that defensive back room in the deep end where you don't have a lot of numbers. You don't have a lot of experience and in Florida States in and in a tough spot, but yeah, Travis J it's just one of those stories along the line, kind of like with Demory Tate. And I put, piece those guys right there with one another which was themed what could have been definitely a disappointing end to his career at Florida State you know made a little made some contributions there sporadically during uh, 2020 and 2021 but was ineligible this past season obviously dressed out for that Oklahoma game but didn't end up playing that night that uh, Florida State won the Cheez-It Bowl so yeah, I mean, like Logan said, a very talented player coming into Florida State, someone who's very highly regarded, um, a Florida State fan who grew up locally, like Logan mentioned, and, uh, out of perennial winner here, Madison County, you know, a program that's always in state, always going to state championships and bringing home titles and has also provided Florida State some pretty damn good players in the past. You know, you think of a guy like Chris Thompson or Jacoby uh, McDaniel, you know, two guys who came in back in the day. So, I mean – a program that Florida state has a connection to. So it just sucks that in the end, it didn't work out with Travis J. He went through academic issues, injuries, everything and stuck around. I'm, I'm honestly surprised it took this long. I figured if he didn't transfer directly after the season, he might've just stuck around, but Mm -hmm. you know, it's a shame it didn't work out as, as freaky as an athlete as he is can play all over the defensive backfield. You love the idea of a Travis J. It just, it just didn't work. And sometimes that happens. 
it does. It does. And I don't know, man. It stinks. I'd, and I think, too, he's going to get a good opportunity, hopefully, somewhere, and they can utilize his talents in the right way uh, because you know it's there. You see the little signs here and there. But, whew, man, he, he's super, super gifted. So we'll see what ends up happening there and where he finds his next home. And then one more player on the defensive side of things here. Uh, with Bishop Thomas, a defensive tackle, uh, redshirt freshman, didn't get to see a whole lot of playing time yet, but he decides to enter the transfer portal. He's a guy that would show some flashes during practices and add a few things during spring camp. And then, which is pretty interesting to note, got to see him on the outside during the spring showcase where he kind of looked pretty nice. Uh, you know, depending on the competition he was going against uh, on the offensive line, but nonetheless had some flashes and obviously is looking to probably get some more playing time. Don't want to put words in his mouth on what he in- intends on doing, but uh, a player that Florida state would have liked to have in some depth, but you know, you've got a guy like Daniel Lyons uh, that is making strides and improving who got some playing time last year that Odell Hagens continues to rave about him. Uh, and the play that he's bringing to that defensive line. And then you've got a handful of others, but, you know, you know, you lose Thomas here and that's just kind of how it goes. And, you know, I don't know, Florida state's going to, I think Florida state will be fine here. It's not a major loss by any means, but, you know, definitely if you would have lost farmer and Daryl Jackson would be a little bit different, but uh, you know, and I would say Dustin, just looking at some of the practices too, he's definitely undersized compared to the other guys around him. But I don't think that was, is a plays a pivotal factor for him because he would disrupt and he would make some tackle for losses. I'm like, who the heck is that? And Oh, that's Thomas. Who is that guy? Uh, but wish him the best of luck. He had one of the best, like, newcomer interviews highly entertaining good guy uh wishing him the best but you know just not working out uh, at florida state and he's going to go look for a new home elsewhere thomas coming off his first year at fsu only appeared in two games um last season ended up redshirting was named florida state's defensive scout team player of the year so obviously someone that was flashing in practices you talked about it, logan i mean you were able to see him do do some things a couple of times. I mean, we were impressed. But like you said, definitely undersized compared to the rest of the unit. I, I would agree with that assessment. And, yeah, I mean, someone who wasn't really primed to play much of a role this year. I mean, once again, he was going to be someone contributing a lot in practice, helping the scout team um, prepare, you know, the starting offense for the upcoming games. And, you know, there just wasn't much of a role for him right now with the way that unit is lined up and especially with the future, you know, you mentioned Daniel Lyons, but you still got Iobami I- to in that room as well. And both of those guys have showed some real flashes and our two guys at Florida state really likes a lot. And I mean, then if you look at the rest of the room, you know, probably after the season Florida state, it wouldn't be a surprise to see them explore that transfer portal yet again, to try and find someone like they've already brought in someone like Fabian Lovett, someone like Braden Fist, because both of those guys are going to be moving on. And I mean, you're going to need someone to replace them unless, uh, you know, the rest of those guys step into that role. But regardless, I think Florida State will explore to see what is out there. And I mean, they're also looking to add some guys in this high school class as well, involved with some very um, talented high school prospects, some blue chip guys, and they've already got Jamori flag in the fold. So I, I think Florida State, they've got a bright future in that middle, despite the departure of Bishop Thomas. I think he just saw the writer on the wall and didn't see any realistic playing time the next two seasons. And, you know, it's not the day and age of college football anymore where you wait three years before you get your chance. They want to be able to play now. I think that's what it came down to. He's going to go find somewhere he's going to be able to play sooner rather than later. Yeah, and that, that's the thing. You know, Florida State's at a different trajectory than when he came in, let's be honest here. So there's some guys that they're looking for immediate impact, like a Fisk, like a Daryl Jackson, like Dustin was just talking about there. So for some of these guys that are younger that feel like they should deserve some more playing time, and it's like I, like we were just talking about like the Micah Pittman situation a little bit different because it deals with recovery and health that he's having to take care of. But they're looking for the best – they're looking for the best scenario for their players. I think, you know, Odell Hagens is Odell Hagens. He, he's going to look out for his, his guys and he's going to look for, look for a good opportunity for them. And he's going to tell them the real deal and the real spiel. And if you're not going to be seeing a lot of playing time, they're going to, you know, he'll, he'll let you know that. And, you know, Florida state will look and see if they can add some depth there too, if need be, we'll see what they end up doing this off season. 
Dustin, Jen's asking here, how long is the NCAA transfer portal open for? Yeah, so the transfer portal spring window is actually closed now. It opened back on April um, 15th and then closed on Sunday, April 30th at the conclusion of the day. So basically the only people that can still transfer at this point are graduate transfers, those who have um, obtained their bachelor's degree. So, I mean, potentially – at the end of the spring semester, if there are some people that graduate from Florida State, they could still enter their names into the portal, explore opportunities elsewhere. And I mean, the same thing for schools around the country. So, I mean, technically it's not over, but I don't, I'm not really expecting um, any other departures from Florida State at this time. And the transfer portal window is just names entering. People could still go to other schools yep. if they're already in the portal. That's a that's a good thing to note. You just have to enter your name during the window, and then you can commit at any time. Like we're seeing with Florida State, we'll get to these transfers in a minute. But bringing in two guys um, this weekend, and you know they could technically join the program at any time. Our guy James is coming in at the right time because we're about to jump into these two transfers that are coming to visit oh, Florida State okay. this weekend. It's perfect timing. Perfect. Beautiful. Let's jump into it, guys. Let's start off with Keon Coleman, Michigan State wide receiver. He decided to enter the transfer portal. Some interesting notes here. As of just yesterday, he actually uh, sat down uh, with the program and was speaking to their head coach about potentially probably, you know, getting a good talk about, Hey, you should probably stick around with the program. Mel Tucker would like to have his highly productive wide receiver back in the program going into the 2023 season. But now getting the news, Dustin, you were told earlier today that he would indeed be visiting this upcoming weekend, a player that if you just watched a couple of his highlights, you're intre- you're interested immediately, but a guy that can go up for the ball, grab it, can go deep. This could be a deep, deep threat kind of player if you're thinking about Florida State's offense going into next year. But this is a big profile transfer that Florida State's getting on campus this upcoming weekend. Uh, what are you, what are you thinking here, D. Lou, about this situation? Because there's obviously a lot of other programs that would like to get him on campus, but Florida State has a lot to offer here with a big season ahead and what Mike Norvell has been able to do, along with Ron Dugan's give him, got to give credit here, what he's been able to do with wide receivers transferring in their first year. And we saw the production last year out of Johnny Wilson and Micah Pittman. There's, there's an opportunity here for Florida State to, to sell pretty well. Definitely. I think seeing what Florida State has done on the field over the past couple of years is definitely – Um, an aspect that Florida State is going to sell during this uh, transfer recruitment for Keon Coleman. But this isn't a typical recruitment. These parties are very familiar with one another. Florida State heavily recruited Keon Coleman out of high school whenever he was a four-star Louisiana coming – or a four-star wide receiver coming out of the state of Louisiana. They weren't able to get him on campus at the time because this was back during – um, the COVID-19 pandemic, and if, if everyone remembers, uh, recruiting was kind of shut down there from March 2020 to about June 2021 or so, so about 15 months. And during that time, Keon Coleman actually ended up committing and signing with Michigan State. So by the time it opened back up, things were kind of over uh, with Keon. But at the time, Florida State made a really good impression. Um, they were actually named to his top six back during his high school recruitment, and we actually did an interview with him at the time, the late, great Nate Greer here with the quote um, from Keon Coleman back in 2020. So he said, with FSU, I feel like I have a really good relationship and a strong connection with the coaches. I talk to them every day. They throw the ball a lot, which I like. They talk about me coming there and playing and being a part of that offense. I can be a deep threat, jump ball guy for them, like what they do just the tight relationship with the coaches. They always have good teams and they play in a good conference. So Keon Coleman, you know, he's been high on Florida state over the years. And I think that connection that Florida state built back in the day, that's a huge reason that they're going to be the first program to get him on campus since he entered the portal from Michigan state. And it would be huge for FSU to try and uh, lock this one down this weekend. Don't let Coleman get out of Tallahassee without a commitment. Um, you know, there are some whispers that LSU could be involved, Coleman, like I like I mentioned from the state of Louisiana. But it's important to note that the Tigers did not offer him a scholarship during the course of his high school recruitment. And 
maybe that's something that comes back to bite them the second time around. Obviously now Brian Kelly there, I, I don't believe that he was there. Yeah, he wasn't there at that point during Coleman's recruitment. So that could change a little bit of things. But I think Florida State, you've got to like your chances here with him entering the portal, you getting the first visit, and this relationship that was established a while back. And I think a lot of this stems from his teammate, Jaden Reed, got drafted in the second round by the Packers this weekend. And a lot of the talk was, you know, you know if he had a better quarterback play, he would have been a first-round pick. He had – 55 catches for 600 yards and five touchdowns. Keon Coleman was better. 58 catches, almost 800 yards and seven touchdowns. Mm -hmm. You know, if if he's hearing that chatter about his teammate who went second round going, oh, if he had a better quarterback, plays a first round pick, it's it's no surprise that he's considering Florida State. And I think some of the other schools that were mentioned are North Carolina, who has Drake May, who's going to be a top five pick next year. And Oklahoma is Dylan Gabriel, who's been around the college block for what seems like a decade now. You know, he, he's going to get good quarterback plays somewhere, and he's going to try and loft himself in a first-round pick. Even if it's just a one-year rental for Florida State, that's a hell of a one-year rental. And this is your potential Malik McLean replacement, who obviously departed from Florida State early in the offseason. But Coleman is even more talented and even more proven. Like Austin said, 58 catches for 798 and seven touchdowns last season. Um, a, a legit deep threat, a guy with a ton of athleticism. Um, I mean – he was a two-sport athlete at Michigan State, spent some time with their basketball team as well, appeared in six games uh, with the Spartans during the spring 2022 semester. Didn't play a big role, but I think it says a lot that a guy like that who is mainly dedicated to football was also able to get onto the court with a Michigan State team who normally is one of the best programs in the entire country. So, I mean, you know, this is a guy, a ton of potential still to be tapped. But you're thinking about bringing him to Tallahassee, pairing him alongside Johnny Wilson and Kintron Poitier on the outside. Uh, you're looking at a, a heck of a weapon there in Tallahassee. Because, I mean, it's just like when you have those guys out there on the field, who can you double team? And they're all – Kentron 6'4", Keon 6'4", Johnny's obviously 6'7". You're really able to take the top off some defenses at this point. And that offense yeah. just gets a little bit more tricky to cover. And you're not going to be able to stack the box for for Trey Benson or Natoa Philly. You got you got to really respect the receivers. So F- Florida State's going to be going against a lot of seven man fronts potentially. Yeah, and you got to respect Jaheim Bell and whatever Mike Norvell likes to do with that Ferrari. I mean, like what is what is? I mean, we got to see a few things in the spring. But what what what's going to be happening is a lot of fun things. I have a, have a good feeling. And Mike Norvell is pretty creative. We saw that last year with what he was like in the do. And a few things in the red zone, but yeah, it, it gets scary what, what Florida State could do with Coleman. And you look at Jordan Travis in the year that he's expected to have after a nice, improved season with, with Tony Tokars. I mean, yeah, UNC could be there. You got Drake made. You got Dylan Gabriel. But you've got a program on the rise that can actually go, and you can you can get drafted, and you can also have a chance on putting a ring on your finger. Uh, mm-hmm. And you know I, that helps a ton. And you can now press that you do need to have some some playmakers at the wide receiver position after losing Micah Pittman. Yeah, you've got a guy like Ja'Kai Douglas, but that's a different style of, of player. Bringing in Coleman changes a lot of things, and he's a good one-on-one matchup player that, you know, if Johnny Wilson's getting stacked up, you got Kentron on the left side, Coleman's going to have a lot of chances at one-on-ones, and now defensive coordinators are going to have to start predicting in their game plans on what they're going to have to get do game plan wise against this offense definitely in the wide receiver room it gets tricky for defensive coordinators in that way and they don't want to do all this so uh, we'll we'll see what we'll see what Mike Norvell does and just in general though and what Mike Norvell is able to do in the transfer pool I give him my my bets are my bets feel pretty comfortable in in that area (laughs) Mike Norvell, I will just say off of the last couple of years and what they've been able to produce, but I wouldn't be shocked if he just has a nice little chat with Johnny Wilson. Here it is. This is what I learned during my year at Florida State. We've been able to talk with Johnny Wilson, Dustin, after practices, and he's very grateful. And for Mike Norvell, giving him this opportunity, and he's continued to see improvement. But just a little chit-chat with Johnny Wilson might be able to seal the deal. And then you can throw in a Jordan Travis in there if need be. But, uh, you know, I, we'll, we'll see. It's a big, big weekend for for Coleman. And if you could – I think Coleman's a guy, if he is trying to start – if he wants to get with a new quarterback, he's going to want to create some chemistry early. So he's going to want to make a decision or, uh, sooner rather than later. 
the door the Jordan Travis effect uh could absolutely be huge in this recruitment because like Austin said he didn't have the greatest quarterback last year and it affected the draft stock of uh, one of his teammates I mean now potentially coming to Florida State to play with a, a Heisman candidate and Jordan Travis and someone who's continued to improve over these last two years and absolutely blew it out of the water a season ago it looks like he could be even better in 2024 you know there's not very many there's not very many other uh quarterback rooms in the country that have someone more talented than uh, Jordan Travis. And there's also a role for him to come in and, and play immediately. And I think Florida State can really pitch uh, stability in this recruitment. Because, I mean, you're going back now two or three years since he was a high school recruit. But these guys that recruited him out of high school, Mike Norvell, Ron Dugans, David Johnson, who has the, who has the ties to the state of Louisiana, they're all still here in Tallahassee. You know, they haven't left for other jobs. So mm -hmm. they're still able to to be here and still have that same relationship that they had a couple of years ago. So I think having those guys, Jordan, Travis, you've seen the development from these wide receivers. You know, it, it could be a big weekend in Tallahassee. We'll see how it goes for Keon Coleman. Mike Norvell likes to keep his staff together for the most part, and it could go a long way here in grabbing a really talented wide receiver from Michigan State. Let's talk about another transfer, guys, that's coming in to also visit alongside Coleman this weekend, and that's going to be a safety, which is a major need right now. Florida State is going to bring in Jalen Key from UAB. Tallahassee native played at Godby. This is where I instantly think about Corey Fuller again. What a good addition for Mike Norvell to get Corey Fuller on his staff, but it helps a ton on the recruiting front. But in general, Florida State's got to get some help there at the safety position. Had a pretty good season last year for UAB, looking for a bigger opportunity, potentially at a bigger program, and and then some good playing time at it. But yeah, Florida State's going to try to at least advocate, you know, coming in and, and playing a good bit because right now Florida State's stu stupid thin. We talked about earlier, Shaheem Brown, and you've got Akeem Dent. Those are the guys that have the the experience right now, but Florida State would like to add some extra talent with some experience. Yeah, it's uh, it's only been a couple of days. I believe it was back on Sunday whenever Key already has announced a top six in his transfer recruitment of Florida State, Alabama, Ohio State, Oregon, Ole Miss, and North Carolina. Um, he's coming off visits to Ole Miss and Alabama and going to be getting to Florida State next. And, you know, believed to be taking some more visits after this trip to Tallahassee. We'll see how things go. And, you know, maybe if he potentially locks things down um, before leaving, that's what Florida State would obviously prefer to do here, get him in the fold and not let him get out to visit these other schools. But, I mean, we'll see how it works itself out. Um, like Logan said, a guy from nearby Quincy played at Godby High School, so definitely has some local ties here. And someone that is very experienced at the college level, played for five years, at UAB, his most, his most significant time coming this past season in 2022 when he recorded a, a career-high 60 tackles, 4.5 tackles for loss, two forced fumbles, and three interceptions. Um, interesting enough, you know, going back through his stats, is that his career-high in tackles, uh, 12 against LSU this past fall. So, you know, an interesting nugget there, someone who's had some success against the Tigers, a team that Florida State obviously is going to open up with in Orlando. So I do think – Florida State, you know, they can pitch the local ties here. They can pitch the playing time. So I think you've got to feel good with what Florida State is going to be able to do in this recruitment. But at the same time, you know, you've got those other schools like Alabama and Ohio State and Oregon, teams that have been proven um, as of late, especially Alabama, as far as putting safeties in the NFL. And that's one thing that he's really looking for, an opportunity to get to the next level. Florida State can definitely offer that, but there are some other schools that have proven it a little bit more as of late, uh, for say, I'm sure they'll pitch Jamie Robinson going into the draft this past weekend. So, I mean, we'll see how it plays out. It's like we talked about earlier. Florida State has a huge need at safety, especially for experienced safeties. He's got as much experience as any safety in the portal right now. Um, with the local ties, you'd love to be able to lock him down this weekend, but um, we'll, we'll see what happens. Mm -hmm. Yep, we will. We will. We'll see what Coach Sertan could do in the transfer portal, mm -hmm. see what kind of game he's got on For this sure. end. We'll see. And Austin Austin wanted two safeties. I've got one more for you guys. This is a, a new name to know on the recruiting board. Mm -hmm. Iowa, Iowa Western Community College safety, 
Ashlyn Barker recently picked up an offer from Florida State earlier this week from Adam Fuller, a guy that has four years remaining of eligibility at the college level, redshirted this past season in JUCO. Um, like I said, a new name to know, someone that Florida State just offered. He's announced that he's going to be taking an official visit to Florida State from May 12th to May 14th. So this is Florida State really exploring their options, not only in the transfer portal, but also in that junior college market to maybe add another safety as well. Good. Needed. And, you know, got a good good size of offseason ahead, but Florida State looking pretty early, as they should, doing their due diligence and making sure things are done and depth-wise and bringing in some experience that is needed after growing a little thin in a, in a few spots. But we'll keep a close eye on Coleman, Coleman coming in this weekend along with Key and seeing what happens there. Uh, you never know what some transfers destiny if you get an interview or not, but I would at least make sure you guys are tuned into nolgameday.com or jump into our Discord. If you're on YouTube right now, you can join for free. Go click on the link down below and you can join the Discord where we're talking football nonstop, recruiting. And then now the transfer portal is a huge channel that's blowing up through there. So make sure you guys are tuned in and getting the discussion and getting the latest from Dustin and our guy Tommy Muir down there in Tallahassee. We will at least be out there to bother them a little bit and try to get it. <laughs> yeah. Just get the shot of them walking in. Get the shot. Get the engagement. That, that would be me. As long as I get my engagement, get the shot, I'm out. I'm out. Uh, let's talk a little bit of NFL draft, some undrafted free agents. Let's jump into it first with Jamie Robinson going to the Carolina Panthers in the fifth round. Congratulations to our guy here, the Spear alum. Uh, you know, I think we put out a piece earlier today, but definitely a chip on his shoulder. Def- wasn't expecting to go that late in the draft, but if you're looking at some contract stuff and money wise, Jamie's going to be just fine. Estimated $4.1 million contract with the Carolina Panthers. And I think around like a 368,000, somewhere around that range of a signing bonus. So Jamie's getting well taken care of. VZ, that's good for you because you're right up there in Carolina. He's got the numbers. Now it's time for you to hit him up. You're the shoe plug. So business could be booming here for you too, VZ. He's a mile away from the, from the store now. It's, it's great. Uh, (laughs) I, really, I'm, I'm I'm happy for him. He went a little bit later than than both Logan and I thought. Dustin about nailed it, yep. saying fifth round. Um, they're just happy he's getting an opportunity, getting a chance, and and also keeps Florida State's draft streak alive. And we, we talked about it last week, but it's going to keep going for a couple more years. And both those two guys that got drafted over the last two years are transfers: Jermaine Johnson and Jamie Robinson. But yeah, I mean, hats off to Jamie for getting selected by Carolina, going to be playing there alongside Brian Burns. And, you know, Carolina wasn't one of those teams that we talked about that he took top 30 visits to throughout the draft pro- uh, throughout the draft process. But regardless, sounds like they really like his skill set. Frank Reich was talking about him a little bit following the draft and said they really think he's going to be able to contribute on special teams out of the gate. They think he can play, obviously, at the safety spot, but has the versatility to play some nickel as well. So it really does sound like, and and they talked about his competitive instinct and his grittiness as well, which is something that Jamie obviously brings, especially in that running game coming down and and knocking out running backs. So I think he's going to fit very well in California and sounds like Carolina, not California, Carolina. Sounds like he's excited to play uh, with Bryce young. Sorry. I mean, he was literally the first NFL draft pick to sign his contract. He better have been, better have been excited. He's ready to get to work. And, and as far as that I know, dude, he hasn't, that's, as far as dude, I know, he hasn't I think, been to Charlotte yet. No, he has not. You know where he's at. He's with Coach Storms right now, training yeah. with him. He posted a story <laughs> yesterday. He literally flew down and went straight to training. And, like, he got his contract signed. This dude's, like, training. He probably said, yeah, this is good. Here we go. This is great. Let's just get to work. And he's over here with Coach Storms. And that, and that awesome. I think that's huge too. And it's, it's taken a while for Florida State minor bell to build that, but having players come back immediately wanting to put in work, come at least come back to the program, use the facility. I think that's huge. And what, you know, trying to do that with your alums, definitely your successful alums. I got Jermaine Johnson that absolutely loves coming back to Florida State. He freaking playing up there in New York and he's down here all the time around the program. And so, you know, Jamie, Jamie calls us home and uh, you know, I think he'll, he, he's going to, he's going to, Role 
uh, over there in Carolina. But we get to see him play twice a year with covering the Bucks. So looking forward mm-hmm. to having him coming down and traveling and playing the Buccaneers, and then him going up there and the Buccaneers going up there and traveling. So it'll be it'll be fun. A good addition to the NFC South, definitely with Brian Burns, who is like low key killing it in the league right now. Like low key, just doing his thing, man. Like. What a successful run and career so far for him, and he's still young. He's gonna get, he's gonna get a really big con. He's, he's in line for a very big contract extension right now. Uh, I think yep. we put out the piece last week or within the last ten days or so that he's coming off a little bit of a minor ankle surgery that hindered him a little bit there, but that's not something that's gonna affect the uh, affect him finalizing his contract extension with Carolina, and he's obviously someone that they want to try and build around moving forward as the Panthers try to get back on the right track. And it's also important to note that James can be close to where he started his college career at South Carolina. Columbia is only about an hour and a half from Charlotte. You know, that's real close by. Yep. That is, that is true. That is very true. Let's jump into a couple undrafted free agent notes here. Uh, let's start off with Pokey Wilson getting a chance here with the Los Angeles Chargers. I love that fit. Did I I feel like I mentioned that in one of our most recent pods. Someone's got to clip it and send it to me because I don't have enough patience to go back and look for it. But I it's thought not it would be me. It's not going to be me either. Uh, but maybe one of our viewers that actually that like listens to us and consistently does. Let us know if you do. But anyways, Pokey Wilson with the Chargers. I think I love that fit. You know, definitely with going there with Herbert and being a deep threat there. Uh, We'll see, you know, still got to make the team, got to go through the process of of mini camps and, you know, hopefully get into the training camp. But, you know, just going off of Pokey Wilson, what he's been able to do consistently for Florida State, he's going to get an opportunity somewhere. Not if, even if it's not the Chargers, there's going to be a coach out there uh, that, you know, that will give him an opportunity. And, you know, if you go and watch some hard knocks, you'll see coaches, you know, Hey, I'm going to put in a good word for you. And you, you know, you probably fit better. At least you're not going to fit with our, with what we're doing here. We're going to send you to, you know, give you a better opportunity somewhere else and, and put a good word in for you. But I think Pokey Wilson, if things go right, he, he could, he could stick there. We'll, we'll see. Um, and then Robert Cooper to the Seahawks, Cam McDonald to green Bay, and then Wyatt Rector, got an invite uh, to the Raiders, Las Vegas Raiders too. So waiting on a few more, we were discussing in the production meeting. We're kind of a little surprised that Dylan Gibbons hasn't gotten an invite somewhere, at least that we, that we know of, it would have been publicly put out by now, but maybe weighing his options. We talked about that too. We thought, you know, he was a player that if he didn't get drafted, he'd probably have a few teams where he could negotiate, and get a get a bigger bag, get a better opportunity, yada yada yada, depth wise, player wise, all that kind of stuff. So, uh, still waiting on Dylan Gibbons. But thoughts on uh, a variety of these guys getting an opportunity in the league? You like you mentioned, Pokey going to to Chargers is a great fit. They need that kind of receiver. I know they took Quentin Johnson the first round, but now they've got three just big body receivers. They don't really have that that small shifter guy. Pokey can be that. Um, and as Dustin and I were talking about before the podcast, Cooper going to the Seahawks. That's a place that he visited in the draft process. They don't really have a ton of D line depth. And the only guy they took was in the fourth round. That That's a great spot for him to, to learn and develop and potentially see playing time. We'll see what ends up happening. M- McDonald with green Bay is going to be tougher. They selected two tight ends early in the draft. Um, it's going to be tough to see him seeing the field and sticking around, but maybe he uses it to, to latch on somewhere else. Yeah, I don't really have a ton to add to that. Austin kind of nailed it. I think it's going to be big for Ontario, um, learning behind Keenan Allen and Mike Williams a little bit. Two guys have been doing it at the professional level for uh, quite some time. Like you said, uh, the Seahawks and Robert Cooper have some real familiarity with one another. Um, getting a chance to visit them during the draft process, those top 30 visits, um, they're allowed to do, what would you call it, a, a medical, medical exam and everything like that. So, Robert Cooper coming back from that shoulder injury that held him out of working out at Florida State's Pro Day. That was something that during that visit, Seattle was able to check out, evaluate a little bit. So, I mean, obviously, they've got to feel very positive that Cooper is going to make a full recovery and be able to do something with them to, to pick him up as an undrafted free agent. And like Austin said, I think 
maybe there's a chance for him to stick with Seattle moving forward if he can come back from the injury. Maybe a, pro- a practice squad guy this upcoming rookie season, then we'll see how it goes from there. But, I mean, that's a really interesting one to me. I agree it's going to be tough for Cam McDonald with those two tight ends that, that Green Bay draft. It's going to be tough for him to stick. And I'm very interested to watch Wyatt Rector because we know the Raiders did not bring him in for – his prowess as a tight end. They brought him for what he's done in special teams. Obviously, the co-special teams player of the year for Florida State in 2022 uh, was constantly making huge plays for FSU on that kickoff unit. So, I mean, we'll see how it goes for him. It's very important for uh, the NFL to have these guys who are just special teams lifers. I mean, you think about the Patriots and uh, uh, what was the guy's name? Slater. Can't remember his first name, but Michelle. they had they had the the wide receiver that literally played primarily special teams for oh, oh, yeah. nearly a decade with them. The, I, the names escape me off the top of my head right now, but I mean Wyatt Rector that could potentially be his role if, if he can carve it out and be excellent at it. Yeah, Matthew we'll Slater. See. Yeah, what was the name? Matthew, Matthew Slater. Slater. I was trying to think of it. Yeah, NFL, those special teams coaches like consistency and guys that, you know, put in full effort. And that was exactly what you got out of Wyatt Rector during his time at Florida State. So uh, there's no shocker there. I, I had a feeling that he, when we talked about it, we had a feeling that he'd get at least an opportunity somewhere just because of what he could bring on special teams. And if there's mm-hmm. even more, then yeah, but he's like a versatile, he's like an athlete. And he can do a variety of different things. And he can also throw touchdowns. He can throw uh, two point conversion touchdowns, everything. He can, he can do a lot. Uh, <laughs> that's what he can bring. So we'll see what ends up happening there, and if he can make that fifty three man roster in Vegas, that'd be a pretty fun place to live. Tally to Vegas, a little bit different. Uh, let's jump into some basketball news here, VZ, to end off this episode. Florida State was able to bring in a commit. A nice one here, and I love the last name. I love the last name. That's probably the best thing about it, VZ. But Florida State having to have some help here because they also went through their transfer portal woes and having to bring in some players to be able to play almost right away is definitely what Leonard Hamilton is looking for. But Florida State brings in Georgetown guard Amir Primo. Is it Primo? Primo Primo Spears. It's Amir, not Amir. Primo. It's not Amir. Just say Primo. It's Primo. Just Primo Spears? Yeah. I like the last name, though. It yeah, with, the, with that kind of name, he has to be good at Florida State. Like, he doesn't exactly have a choice. Like, I'm already seeing the Fear the Spears graphics, like, mm-hmm. all over social media. Um, <laughs> Florida State needed scoring. He can score. 16-5-3 for Georgetown last year in, you can argue, was the best conference in college basketball last year. The Big East was tough. Really, really tough last year. Granted, Georgetown was not good. Um, but nonetheless, he could score. Florida State needs a score, and it's going to be a pretty seamless transition. Has familiarity with the new assistant coach, Kevin Nickelberry, in their one season at Georgetown. That's going to help his transition to Florida State. There's some talk he's going to need some waivers since this is going to be his third school. He started his career at Duquesne. But since Georgetown had their coach fired, Patrick Ewing, I can't see there being any issues here. Should be able to play right away. Voice crack. Wow. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it, it's a good fit. Uh, I think it's going to be a good fit for Florida State. They needed some guard production. You know, Worley can be your defensive guy. Spears is going to score. Th- that's what they needed more than anything. This may be Florida State's final roster. We'll see. They're still in contact with a couple guys. They reached out to the new North, North Dakota State transfer, Grant Nelson, earlier today. And they're in contact with a couple of other bigs as well. And they still have eight days to kind of figure it out before the basketball transfer window closes. Um, but as of right now, I think their roster might be set. And, you know, as I said on Twitter earlier in the week, it's not the greatest roster in terms of top end talent, but you've got 11, 12 guys that you can consistently rotate. And if guys stay healthy, it should be a pretty decent defensive team. But we'll see if it all can come, can come together and they can get that chemistry right that they didn't have the last two seasons. But it's an interesting roster, nonetheless, and for, and Coach Hamilton should finally be able to keep guys fresh with, with the constant rotations if this ends up being the final final roster. 
I hated the health problems that Florida State had to go through and injury wise. It put them in a pretty tough spot last year, but you were hoping some of the other talented guys were able to step up and just too much inconsistency. You lose Matthew Cleveland. Have we figured out where Matthew Cleveland's going to end up? Have we got a decent prediction not, yet? Not yet. Um, I think we talked last week. He did a final three of Miami, Auburn, mm-hmm. and Missouri. Th- there's there's some chatter around Miami right now. I'm not going to lie to you, but I still just I can't picture it in my head. <laughs> like like he posted the picture on on his Instagram story. It just, it just didn't look right. It just doesn't <laughs> it doesn't fit him. <laughs> and, and hopefully he sees that, but <laughs> we'll see what ends up happening. I'm expecting a decision soon. I don't know how soon, but I, I think by the next podcast, we'll know where he's going. That'd be strange. Dude who puts a dagger down on him ends up joining him. He's he's done you down twice in the last <laughs> two years. You can't, you can't join him after that. Like, it's uh, not allowed. No, nope. Tell you what, if I got a bag, I'd throw the U up right now. No, I'm oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> Do they even have bags to give anymore? I know they're a little dried up right well, now. Oh, yeah. Oh, one. damn. All right. Damn. Okay. Stock prices are going down rapidly as we speak. I, I, no, they're not going down. They are dirt down. They are like, what, 50 cents right now? <laughs> Something dirt like that down. and in danger of being delisted and all kinds of stuff. But John Ruiz says, the feds are lying, so yeah. gotta believe, gotta believe him. Yeah, we definitely believe that, hundred percent. I, I will say the, the the newest Twitter beef between Dan Rovell and John Ruiz is my favorite new Twitter beef. It's hysterical. I love it. It seems like it's perfect for both sides. Dan Rovell just loves that kind of just little beef he gets because he gets engagement. <laughs> he does. He he, does. he he feeds off of it. He feeds oh, off yeah. that negative energy from sports companies. Yep. And Ruiz, ju- and Ruiz just wants attention. Like, that's all he wants. It, it works out for both parties. Beautiful. And, and the funny thing is, I don't like either person. <laughs> that's, what, that's what makes it entertaining. Yep. Yeah. Let them do their thing. It's entertaining, at least. Anything else that we want to hit on? Anything happening next week? We are we are definitely in the, in the off season. I mean, luckily, there's been some interesting things going on. But that's going to start slumming down slowly but surely. I don't think there's anything else that really need to note on. Nothing recruiting wise. We already talked about what's happening this upcoming weekend with Florida State's visitors with Key and Coleman. Mm-hmm. But that'll be a big one. Like I said, make sure you guys are in our Discord. And I know a lot of y'all have been listening to our audio version podcast, but I'll be putting the Discord into our description. I think it's already in there all the time, but you can easily just click that, go down there, click that. It's free to join. I promise you it's free. And if you're on YouTube right now, feel free to hit the like button. We had a lot of people on YouTube joining us this evening. We might have to move to 7 p.m. Let us know in the comments if you guys would like us to do 7 p.m. or 8 p.m. But we had quite a bit of viewers on for this 7 p.m. episode. Might have to see what the data shows us, see if we need to do a little bit more of this. Would that work for you, Dustin? I don't know what time your makeup schedule is is but yeah i mean it varies by the week so it changes a little bit we'll just have to play it by ear okay play by ear type of deal can we uh watch and i, I you know i just want to get y'all's take on this real quick just to finish a little fun thing but i'm gonna share yeah. my screen and show y'all because i need like a little distraction this week but have y'all seen the mike norvell for 8 p.m it's the mike norvell video here I don't know what it's going to show. Is here. the audio on this real though? Because I thought it sounded fake. <laughs> we're about we're about to just look at this. So, for our p- people listening audio wise, we need to describe what's going on and give some context. So, Minervell was at a charity golf tournament uh, yesterday, and the tweet here shows Minervell end quote hitting a 400 plus yard drive, which I'm not going to go against Coach here. I don't know if Coach listens to our shows. He definitely follows us on Twitter, so I'm kind of worried he could be listening to this. But I'm just going to get y'all's He's take not. on it. What? Look at this shot here. I don't know if I can make this full screen, but you can see it. Some uh, good editing. That's what I'm saying. Is this real? I don't. I don't think it is. <laughs> <laughs> I don't not, think it's, it's real. Well, no. Go go back to when it lands on the green. Well, it's not that. No, no, no. I'm telling you. Go back to when it lands in the green. 
the, the European World logo tours in the top right corner. That wasn't there originally. <laughs> like, what was man. it? The, look at the top right. There's no logo right there, and then now there is. Come uh, on, they added, you know how they added it whenever it. Come changed. on, man. The it's like one of those pictures where you look at it and you're like, "What's different?" I didn't even notice that. Good job, Austin. Yeah. Well, look at well. This is the even harder one to notice, but watch the little shift and change here. So watch, right there, right yeah. there, and just did a little, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so definitely not real, but you know, FSU Twitter is definitely going to make it seem real. So congratulations to Mike Norvell on a 400 plus yard drive to get you right <laughs> onto the green. <laughs> but I'll I'll be honest though, I'm just I just need to see a swing here. It's pretty damn good. It's a pretty damn good swing right there from Coach Norvell. These, these dang AI videos are getting too good. They're too getting good. wild. They're getting wild. Uh, but yeah, that's gonna wrap up this week's episode. If you're on YouTube right now, we would definitely appreciate it. We're already at 70 likes tonight. So if we can get up to like 80, 90, that would be massive. It just helps us get this live video out to more FSU fans, which creates more discussion in the comments and yada yada yada. So appreciate everybody coming out here and hanging us hanging out with us this evening. We are don't hang on- us, please. No, we don't. No. <laughs> please no. Uh, we're on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify. We're on YouTube. And come hang out with us in the Discord as we go into the offseason transfer portal stuff kicking up a ton. So make sure you get the latest on that for this weekend. But, yeah, everybody have a great rest of y'all's week. And we will talk to you guys next week at either 7 or 8 o'clock. We'll see. We'll see what the data tells us. We'll see. The numbers numbers don't lie. we got to see what the numbers tell us. But, yeah, appreciate y'all. Have a great rest of y'all's week. Peace.